Today is part two of our conversation with Davis Daniel. You'll get to hear what Davis said to you, the Locked On Everydayers and the fans of the Angels, about being a Major League Baseball player. It's time to get Locked On with Mike and John, and this is Locked On Angels. You are Locked On Angels, your daily Los Angeles Angels podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SiriusXM by searching Locked On Angels. And if you'd like to give back to the Super Halo Bros for all this angel content, here are some things that you can do. Leave us a rate and a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. And if you're not subscribed already, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscription button and become a Locked On Everydayer. And whether you're watching or listening, come over to YouTube, leave a comment. It's one of the best ways to get in touch with us and be a part of the conversation. Thank you for being here for part two of our conversation with Davis Daniel. This is Locked On Angels, where it's your team every day. You've got the Fresh Brothers here with you, a.k.a. the Super Halo Bros. My name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. Mike, we had ourselves a great conversation with Davis Daniel, and it was so good. We had to spread it out over two episodes because there was so much conversation that was had, and so we're glad that you're here for part two. And I'm actually... Really intrigued to know what our Locked On Everydayers are going to feel about some of the things that Davis brought up in today's show. Look, he's got goals and designs on making the rotation in 2024. Mike, the one thing that stands out to me, and we're going to talk about this at the end of the show after his interview, the coaching staff. Yeah. That's helped him yep. along the way. So lots of things to get into on this episode. So we hope you'll enjoy part two of our conversation with Davis Daniel. Hey, when you came up to the majors this season, I know, again, you got to spend a little time there last year, but is there, and at the end of the day, you guys are all teammates, but is there, is there any, uh, is there a part of you that's just like, Oh snap, that's, that's trout. That's Otani. That's Rendon. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, is yeah. there any part of you that's just kind of like, Whoa, this is, this is real. I'm with these guys. What does that mean to you? Or how does that feel when you're, when you get called up like that? Yeah, no, it's very cool. I mean, it, it's it's kind of a – I get asked this a lot, and it's kind of a, a crazy thing, um, sharing a locker room or sharing a, a field with, with some of these guys like Trout and Otani and Rendon. And, you know, I mean, all these guys, they're, they're – some of them are guys that I've watched since I was in high school. And, yeah. you know, it's it's crazy to be around them for sure. But it's also – it's it's very you, – very quickly you learn that they're just another guy and they're normal mm. and they're cool and – like they're just like every guy you've ever played with that, um, you know, they want to win, they want to compete and they're good dudes. And um, so I think all of that was, was very cool just to be around and see like, and quickly realize, man, these guys are just like me or anybody else. There was a, uh, there was a moment in the game against the twins and they, they clinched their division. And I believe Ohapi was at the plate and he kind of stood off, to the side and, you know, it got a lot of attention because you could see that, you know, he was looking out at that and saying, that's where I want to be. And I know that you were there for that game. What did, what did that mean for you? Did you have kind of similar feelings? Like I know you're up toward the end of the season, but um, did you have similar feelings in that way to, to see a team make it like that? And how did that feel for you? Yeah, I actually, I pitched that game that uh, Minnesota ended up clinching. Um, and I had a good buddy that, that played on the other team that I played with in college, Edward Julian. Um, and so I got the chance to catch up with him before and after, you know, that series. And, um, I definitely think that, you know, it's just extra motivation and, mm -hmm. and seeing how much fun that, that he was having and they were having. And, um, you know, that, that kind of the, the work was all worth it kind of deal. And, um, so it, it was very cool to watch. Um, obviously I wish it was us, um, uh, but being on the other end, it's definitely cool and, and motivating to, to want to do that at some point in my career as well. Uh, I'm of the opinion that when, like in the business world, when, when something's not great, good leaders want to come and make it great. Right. And I know that there could be a narrative around the angels. They've had 10 straight losing seasons. Nobody really wants to come here. Right. And we don't listen to those fans, but <laughs> there, there is that narrative out there. Right. And so I, I'd love to hear your insight as a, a player on the team right now, who's coming up, wants to make an impact. Is there a, I want to, I want to put my, my thumbprints on this. I want to leave an impact. I want to have a legacy. I don't want to go somewhere else where they're already winning. I want to be here and I want to be a part of something here and make this great. Is that, 
Is that kind of your mindset or where do you find yourself right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, since, uh, since I've been around, you know, since ever since my first full season in 21, um, and just kind of hearing from Perry talk about, you know, like you guys are the next, you know, wave and, and it's going to start with you guys. And, um, you know, we got to start changing things around here. Um, you know, obviously I think the core group of young guys, um, along with the, the, um, you know, incredible vets that we have, we have a chance to, to really turn this around and, and do something special. And, um, I definitely would love to be a part of it. Speaking of change, uh, with that Ron Washington presser for fans was, uh, causing us to want to run through walls for him. <laughs> so <laughs> fire us up, Ron, let's go. <laughs> we were so ready for that. W- what was that like for you? And what's it like knowing that he's going to be the manager? What do you anticipate? What are you excited about? What's the vibe in the, in the locker room right now? Yeah. I mean, everything that I have heard, and I, I obviously don't know Ron Washington personally, but everything I've heard about him and, and seen about him seems, you know, very positive and, and really good. I think, um, you know, growing up a Braves fan and, and watching him help lead them to a World Series and things like that. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, very cool stories from from friends that have played for or around, been around him. Um, so it's definitely an exciting exciting place. I, I know you can tell you know from anybody in this game that that he puts in work and that and that he works hard and, and wants to get a job done. Um, you know, it's very few times in his career that he's set out to do something and not done it. So. Um, you know, it's, it's an exciting, uh, hire and somebody that I think everybody's excited to play for. Where do you see yourself, uh, in, in 2024? Do you want to, you know, be on the major league club? Obviously like that's the goal, but like, do you see yourself in the rotation or out of the bullpen and, uh, being on this MLB roster? Um, just, just where, where would you like to be in 2024? Yeah. I mean, obviously I would like to be on the roster and have a chance to be in that rotation. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I, I bring a, a, a good enough, um, ability and skill set to, to be able to contribute to this team, um, uh, you know, whether that's in the rotation or the bullpen or, um, you know, whatever, all that stuff will play out how it's supposed to play out. And, um, but, you know, obviously the goal would be to, to be in that rotation and, and help contribute to win a lot of games. Are there, uh, are there coaches, or, or uh, pitching staff along the way in your career through the minors that you can you can name that re- really had an impact on you or helped you figure things out uh, in your career? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the first guy that really stands out for me would be uh, when I was in high A, Doug Henry um, mm. was our pitching coach, you know, and, you know, a lot of a lot of high A pitching coaches or, or um I would say a lot of lower level pitching coaches across this game, um, you know, not that they aren't very knowledgeable, but they, they just haven't been at the top. And, and Doug Henry's a guy that was in a bullpen with Kansas city Royals when they won a world series. And, mm. um, you know, had a lot of knowledge that, that he helped a lot of us out. Um, and he, and he was fun to be around, man. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been to Pasco, Washington, to watch any dust devils games, but it's not the most attractive city. And, and, <laughs> and Doug, Doug had a way of keeping it fun and interesting. And, and at the same time, teaching us a lot. And, um, he was a guy that he was really the first guy in pro baseball that like I was around where I was like, you know, he, he believes in me and he really thinks that I have a chance to, to be in the big leagues. Oh, that's um, awesome. And then, you know, there's, there's been a bunch along the way since I think, uh, Wirtz and double a was was wonderful to work with and you know he really helped craft my slider into what it is i think uh um, he's very smart and threw a really good slider back when he played and um, taught me a really good one um and then uh, you know other guys that stay you know dylan axelrod and buddy carlisle i know um they had a, a tremendous impact on me and i wouldn't have been where i was without them um and you know, it, it's been uh, a lot of good development for me as far as pitching goes, and uh, I've enjoyed everyone that I've worked with. Hmm. What are you working on right now? If if you had to work on pitching and throwing strikes, all of those things, what is it specifically in your mind? Like, I got to get this right so that I can be in that starting rotation in 2024. Yeah, I think, you know, just continue to be able to throw anything in any count. I think uh, towards the end of last year, I really was able to throw all four pitches to righties and lefties, and I felt like this year, uh, the, the changeup was for whatever reason, 
um, not really doing what I wanted to do against righties and the slider wasn't quite doing what I wanted it to do against lefties. Um, so I think that's kind of the biggest thing for me this off season is getting back to being able to back toward the slider to lefties and, and throw it to the back foot. And then um, against righties being able to back toward my change up and, and really get that thing below the zone against righties. I think uh, any time that a hitter can eliminate a pitch, it, it, it helps you know, helps them out tremendously. And if, Mm. you know, if they're coming up to the plate, knowing that, you know, in any count, I can throw any of my four pitches. I think that just makes me that much better. So if you uh, were to give us a rundown of what the off season routine looks like for you, what's the, what's the day to day in Davis Daniels day? Yeah. uh, I'm up every morning about 7am making breakfast, having a cup of coffee and then I uh, drive about 30 minutes south to a gym. We've got a really good group. There's like, uh, I think this year we've got like 18, 19 pro guys. Um, you know, we've got five, six guys that have pitched in the big leagues that all train together. Um, so it's a good group that really pushes each other. And we're we're in there, you know, eight to noon sometimes, you know, whether not always are we under a bar and squat, but, you know, whether even just in there hanging out and, uh, you know, just picking each other's brain on pitching and stuff. I think uh, last year was my first off season up here. It's a place called Tinsley performance. And uh, hmm. last year was my first uh, off season up there. And it really helps me. I think, uh, you know, I went into the off season and games 25, 30 pounds last year. Um, so that that's kind of day to day, get, get done around noon, come home, do chores and cook dinner. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You still have chores? Yeah. You get an allowance yeah. as well, bro? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, That's great. Mar- married life. Back to, yep. back to doing chores and That's right. before she gets home from work. <laughs> <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. We yeah. commend yeah. you for that. <laughs> Locked on Angels is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. And right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on all of the NFL action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including the spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. If you get 150 bucks, are you going to buy me a better Christmas present this year? I already, I already bought you the gift. Oh. It wasn't 150 bucks. No, oh, dang it. <laughs> Because I didn't win. <laughs> well, you could win, and you could win 150 bucks. Who are you picking? You didn't win. <laughs> I didn't play. Uh, uh, <laughs> I got to play. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on right now so you can play $5 money line bet. You can win 150 bucks if your team wins. FanDuel is the official betting partner of the NFL. This is Locked On Angels on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Hey, everydayers, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top stories in sports like Shohei Otani's AL MVP from last week. You got the local experts of Locked On from all the different teams, and of course, Mike and myself, And they have all the national shows as well, covering each and every league. So go to Locked On Sports today on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, and be an everydayer who's part of the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Hey, I want to ask your opinion on something, because Mike and I had this discussion on the show a couple of weeks ago, and it was around the topic of like pitch efficiency, going deep into games, Um, you know, limiting your pitch count and whatnot. And I realize it's like a delicate balance between how you get guys out, whether that's the strikeout or you're getting them to pop out or fly out. How do you feel in terms of, you know, having an efficient start? Like what do you do best when, when you look back at it and you're like, dang, I got through like six, seven innings on, you know, this many pitches. Um, What's your approach in that situation? Yeah, I think um, the the two biggest things for me are, are race to two strikes and first pitch strikes. I think mm. um, if I if I look at at all of the the starts that I've pitched deep in in my career, there are very few that I get you know into that seventh inning or beyond, and it and it's not a day that I'm constantly o one and constantly getting to two strikes. Mm. I think uh, you know 
obviously, you know, if you're, if you're one all the time, you know, by the time you get second, third time through the lineup, like those guys are wanting to swing more for sure. pitch. They're, you know, whether that's swing and miss or, or softly hit balls at that point, it's like, you know, I don't have to necessarily throw a strike for them to still be aggressive on the first pitch. So I think really setting the tone and, and um, working ahead is, is the biggest key for me. And, you know, it's a direct correlation to my best starts throughout my career. We always hear about like second, third time through the order for a lot of starters in MLB. And you kind of alluded to it just now, but um, how does your game plan change over the course of, you know, going through, going through the starting nine, like a, like a third time or maybe even a fourth time? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, like I've been saying all, all the whole time is that, you know, having four pitches, I think really gives me an advantage um, and being able to throw all four to both sides, I think really helps me be able to face those guys a third time. I think, uh, you know, there, there are very few first and second at bats in a game where a guy sees all four, mm. um, whether that's, you know, a, a 10 pitch at bat, like maybe something like that is, is a guy that, that might see the fourth pitch, um, but typically the first two times through the order, um, you know, at, at most you're seeing three of the four. Um, and so I feel like at that point, it's like, you know, you come back around the fourth and, and they still have in their head, like, okay, I haven't seen this, like they're still on the, on the lookout for that stuff. So I think, uh, being able to, to have something that they haven't seen still in the fifth, sixth, seventh inning is, is huge. Hmm. So take me to the mound because as John mentioned earlier, we're nerds. We haven't played. Uh, so t- <laughs> take me on the mound. What, what's going through your mind as, as you're facing a, a, a pretty good hitter, like a, like a Mike Trout or a Shohei Otani, what are you thinking about? What, what are you considering? Uh, what, what are the nerves like? What's the anxiety like? Tell, tell yeah. me about that. Um, I mean, for me, thought process, every pitch is, is basically tunnel based. I think, um, I, I like to think of everything as a tunnel. So, hmm. um, but not so much based on what the pitch was called before, but what was executed. So hmm. whether, whether I hit my spot or miss it, I'm throwing based on where the pitch finished. So oh, interesting. So if I throw, you know, fastball up, you know, even if it was called down and I miss up, my next pitch is going to be based on that. So if I'm at the top of the zone, I, I'm more likely going to throw a curveball off of it or a fastball up again, or change eye levels and go down away. Um, so you, you kind of have like two or three options based on every, you know, set tunnel that that I kind of visualize while I'm on the mound. And, um, so that's kind of the thought process for me is like figuring out what plays off of the pitch prior. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things that add into that, like, you know, whether the hitter check swung, or if he swung mm-hmm. and miss, or if he fouled it off, like, a lot of those things factor in with it. But generally for me it is you know there's two maybe three options based on the pitch prior um so i try to simplify that as much as i can and um it it doesn't really sound that simple when i say it but when i'm standing (laughs) on the mound when i'm standing on the mound thinking through it 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 comes to my mind much much simpler than i'm able to explain it but uh sure so that that's kind of the main thought process for me and um it's been that way ever since i can remember so yeah that's why you're on the mound and we have a podcast. <laughs> it's simple for you. And that's why we're asking, does the umpire play any part in that? And as you're answering that question, give us your, your thoughts on uh, automatic strike zones like robo ups. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously the last couple of years pitching mostly in Salt Lake, they, they had the robo on. So that didn't, I guess the robo ump played a factor into what I was going to throw because mm. it eliminated it eliminated some of the top of the zone where I like to throw my fastball, and, and it eliminated you know some some certain things that you could have gotten with a, with a human umpire, um, you know, good or bad. I think it, it it affected both sides. I don't think it necessarily favored one way or the other, but I mm. I don't think that if you ask many hitters or pitchers, they would say that they preferred it. I think that there's probably some people that like are okay with it or, you know, they think like, you know, it, if they did some tweaks, it could work. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think the majority of players, including myself, definitely prefer a human umpire. Um, whether you miss it or get it right, 
you know, at the end of the day, like when I'm coming off the mound and you have to come check me for sticky, if you tell me like, Hey, that's on me, I missed one. Or, you know, I'm able to have a, a conversation with somebody that says, you know, Hey, where'd you have that pitch? Um, like to me, that's, that's very beneficial mm. and in my mindset as far as and everything else, I think, um, I just prefer the human element. Of All right, Davis, what's one thing that fans don't know about playing baseball that they really need to know? Um, yeah, I think, I think a big thing is just, uh, you know, it, it, this is a game and, and, you know, we're obviously very thankful to the fans and, and the things that, um, you know, the fans and, and outside people do to, to impact this game. Um, but at the same time, this is our, our profession and our job and, mm. and we take it very, very seriously. Um, and I think that sometimes, um, fans or outside sources will think like, Oh, somebody doesn't care. Or they're not, um, putting as much effort into it as somebody else. But mm. at the end of the day, you know, this is what we get paid to do. And these guys work very hard to do it. And we're very privileged to be able to do it. Um, and it's something that not many guys take for granted. So definitely. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. And, uh, it's, it's a reassuring as, as fans, especially the angels that like, you know, you guys, you guys care about what you do and you get out there and you get after it. And we know that you guys are working hard, even in the off season, like staying, staying ready and staying prepared and, you know, taking extra innings down in Arizona and, and coming out of it a stud, you know? So that's, that's awesome to hear. All right. I, I got another question and I'm interested to know how this felt. Uh, Chase Silseth goes four against the A's. You come in and you go five scoreless against the A's and you pick up your first major league win. What was that day like? What was that moment like? And what was it like getting your first win? Yeah, man, it was awesome. I think, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy after the game, I thought about it. And I don't think since high school when I pitched, played seven inning games that I had pitched the last out of, an, of a game. Oh, wow. College, <clears throat> college, pro ball, none of it. So it was like, you know, I just, I, I hadn't had that feeling in a very long time of like throwing a pitch and getting to go dap up the catcher and turn around and be in my oh, wow. like <laughs> all, all, that whole, that whole scenario. Like I haven't done it since high school. So then all of a sudden to do it, on the biggest stage and, and, you know, be with those guys was awesome. Um, uh, uh, you know, getting that last out. I also, I, I remember sitting in the dugout thinking that Silseth had gone three because I was just not for whatever reason I was overthinking it. And so I was going out for what I thought was the eighth, hmm. like mentally preparing myself, like, all right, two more, two oh, more. Wow. Got this. <laughs> And then, like, looking up at the scoreboard after warming up in the ninth and being like, oh, wow, this is the ninth inning. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, like, all of a sudden it hit me like, oh, we're almost there. Like, you can do this. And huh. so, That's so that, cool. that moment was, you know, kind of a lapse of thought, I guess. But um, it was it was a very cool experience getting to finish a game up there and get a win and hmm. um, getting to go in and celebrate with the guys. It was a lot of fun. So it is like the movies, right? So the volume does go down and you can't hear the crowd, right? We've never Basically, done it before. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe that was a good thing that you thought it was the eighth and it turned out to be the ninth. Right. right? right. Oh, yeah. I think it, I think it was, I was, it was like a, I feel like it could have gone two ways. Either I looked up and saw ninth and was like, Oh crap. Like, here we go. <laughs> or, or the way that it did go was like, look at the scoreboard and be the ninth. And was like, oh, wow, we're already here. Like, hmm. we're, we're basically done. <laughs> yeah, love that. Is there a stadium that you're hoping to pitch in because you just have this, oh, man, I can't, I would love to be there. I'd love to stand on that mound where he stood. Is there a stadium that you're looking forward to pitching in one day? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously the, the Wrigley and Fenway and, um, Yankee Stadium, like those are going to be at the top of everyone's list. Dodger yeah. Stadium, um, you know, those are those are obviously venues that are historical that um, I have dreamed of pitching in since I was a kid. But um, you know, maybe the one that's not as obvious would be pitching in Atlanta. I think, yeah. mm -hmm. being so close to family and friends and growing up a Braves fan, I think it would be uh, a very cool experience to get to get back in that stadium that you know I've been to as a fan so many yeah. times to be able yeah. to to be on the other end of it would be a, a dream come true. Can they resurrect a Fulton County stadium for you and just let you stand out there? <laughs> yeah. I was yeah, going awesome. to say Turner field. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mostly, mostly Turner field from yeah. there, but uh, it, it would be awesome. I mean, Turner field's still up, you know, maybe they'll play an exhibition game or something. 
There you they, go. they should let you in. Don't they know who you are? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nobody's got keys, bro. Let's, let's ask some questions. <laughs> well, hey, Davis, this was really fun, and we really appreciate your time. Look, Mike and I are are diehard fans of the Angels, and the fact that you're part of this team is uh, something special. And yeah. again, like you, as fans, like you came up last season and just really impressed. And and both Mike and I were like, dang. We like that guy. Like, yep. let, let, we want to root for that guy. And so the fact that, you know, we're doing our best to cover the Angels Monday through Friday, and it means a lot that you would take the time to, uh, you know, talk with us and let our fans get to know you as well. So we're we're hoping that the best is yet to come for you, especially in 2024 and especially for this Halo team. So we really appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Was, uh, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to do our end of the job if it wasn't for fans and people like you. So we appreciate you guys just as much. Oh, that means a lot. Thank you so much, Davis. Yeah, thanks, yep. Davis. Good chatting with you. Yep, y'all too. All right, Mike. Lots of good stuff there from Davis Daniel. We want to thank him again for being part of the conversation with us, being part of Locked On Angels. But I got to say, you want to know what stood out to me? What's that? The the guys he said who helped him along mm. in his career. And, yeah. and I'm a little bit concerned, Micah. We haven't had a chance to address <laughs> this yeah. on Lockdown Angels just yet. Now, he mentioned that Doug Henry in high A helped him out a lot. Wirtz and double A helped him craft his slider. Yeah. But he said he wouldn't be here without Dylan Axelrod and Buddy Carlisle, two mm. guys who are no longer in the Angels organization. Yeah. And not only that, Buddy Carlisle was snapped up like a week later by yeah. the Rays, like maybe yeah. less than a week later right. by the Rays. And, and when you let go of somebody who's part of a staff and then the Rays really want them that quickly, <laughs> yes. you know you did something wrong. Am I yeah. right? Yeah. And it, it reminds me of what Lindsey Crosby said on this show when he came on and talked with us. He said, if the Rays make an offer for any of your players on your team, you have to pause and ask, what do the Rays want this guy? Yes. What can what they, they do? What, they what are we him? not doing? And what are they seeing that we're not seeing? And so, yeah, I was, I was bummed when Buddy left and bummed when Axelrod left. And I'm not surprised that David said that they had had a huge impact on him. John, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're going to talk in tomorrow's episode about the coaching and things like that. I'm excited about the coaches that are going to be on the major league roster, but this is just evidence that the coaching hasn't been great on the major league roster but has been great in the minor leagues. And mm -hmm. Davis is somebody who benefited tremendously because of them. We, we talk a lot, a lot about Reed Detmers going down and then Buddy Carlisle working with him and then him coming back up and being great. But that's only one piece of the story. And what Davis told us was a second piece of the story that these guys had a huge impact, Carlisle specifically, on the pitching staff. And so Hopefully the angels have rectified that or figured out somebody that could come in and really benefit these guys. Because the last thing that this team needs is to lose really good coaching because they really haven't had it, at least at the major league level for a few years. You think it's Percy's fault, Mike? You think it's Percival's fault? What an interesting conversation about that, right? Like yeah. with, with Percy coming in and then suddenly people are getting like tossed out. And I, and I get the, it's, I get the old school mentality. I just don't think it has to be, uh, or, this or that. Right? Yeah. I, I think it can be. And uh, I think it can be both. It and, should be, it should be both. And be both. And people, everyone. And, and, <laughs> and that's the thing. Like right, everything's, everything's nuanced. And I think that that's where we get in trouble in our world, right? Things aren't nuanced. And you and I've had long conversations about that, but I think that with Percy specifically, he's got a lot of credibility with the angels, but to make what seemed like a pretty, brash decision like rash decision to just rip those guys out after percy talked to the front office it just doesn't seem wise on on the angels part and, and uh, now locked on every day are probably commenting and going wise angels do you ever put those two words together <laughs> right like it, we had matt wise and he wasn't wise right well <laughs> let's let's make that whole conversation a part of yeah. tomorrow's show as we yeah. discuss the coaching uh, but I want to get back to what Davis said. And one thing that really impressed me, Mike, and maybe it's by virtue of who he's worked with in the minor league system, is that comment about tunnel-based pitching. Now, I really we all like know, that. Yeah. We all know the phrasing of tunneling. If you throw the ball, your slider and your fastball come out of the same tunnel, so the hitter doesn't really understand what's coming toward him until the last minute. Maybe right. the slider 
breaks out of that tunnel at the last second. But I liked what Davis had to say. He's not throwing based off the pitch that he wanted to execute, but how the pitch was executed. And he brought up the example of, hey, if I throw a fastball up, my next pitch is going to play off that one. It's not that I yeah. wanted to throw, you know, if I threw a fastball down and that's where I wanted it and it went up, I'm not going to pretend that it, it was a fastball down. I'm going <laughs> to play off where it ended right. up. I thought that was really smart in terms of, hey, what what a what an interesting chess match of yeah. of a of an at bat that would be against Davis Daniel, right? Yeah, I I really liked where he talked about getting strike one and then mm-hmm. getting to o two as fast as he can mm-hmm. because that has been the struggle of Angel pitchers starters and relievers, especially Again, last reassurance season. for me. Yeah, <laughs> and that's why I would love to see him more involved in this pitching rotation. Yeah, I I can't. I guess I can see a scenario where he's he's not with the major league roster to start, but after talking with him, John, and hearing his mindset mm. and, and him being able to perform up to the potential that he has, and I think what we saw at the end of the year was a lot of growth, and then just talking with him, you can see that the growth, the growth wasn't just physical but mental like you can see that he was starting to discover what it is that he needs to do to be a great pitcher and in the arizona fall league as well i mean he went down there and dominated continuing you know what he said he felt good about yeah in the uh the afl thanks for making locked on angels your first listen of the day hey everydayers locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on youtube it's called locked on sports today and they are there for you 24 7 covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts like john and i from locked on angels and other shows plus our national shows covering every league go to locked on sports today on youtube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel Hey, give us a follow at Lockdown Angels on Twitter and at Super Halo Bros on Twitter and Instagram. Mike, what do we have on deck for tomorrow's show? We talk about those coaches. I love, I love, I love the coaches that have shown up so far. Yeah. Um, especially the hitting coach. I want to talk a little bit about the hitting coach okay. tomorrow on Lockdown Angels. And and Bo Porter was confirmed. I yep. felt like that got confirmed way before they announced it because he followed everybody on angel's twitter so yeah, uh, yeah. that that was he a followed big us indication. welcome Bo i know hey bo <laughs> welcome to the team my friend all right friends we hope that you'll come back and join us for that until then my name is john and that's my brother mike and my name is mike and that's my brother john thanks for being here with us thanks you thank you again to davis daniel for being part of lockdown angels and we'll see you back here tomorrow do you think davis thought i was cooler or you were cooler what do you oh think? me for sure <laughs> you wear glasses i'm, clo- I'm closer i'm closer to his age <laughs> that was a low blow